if you're kind of debating, should I come up or should I not? Candy is involved. If that is a motivator in any way. Again, you're not forced to, but we like having you guys up here. So have a seat. It is so good to have you guys up here today. We're continuing our Advent season. So this is the season where we eagerly await to celebrate the birth of Jesus, who has come and he's coming again. And so last week, if you were here, we talked about another little baby named John the Baptist. And even before he was born, he was given this tremendous job description of what he was supposed to do. And in today's Bible passage, we get to meet the mother of the little guy that's going to be in this box right here. Do you guys remember? What's the name of this thing a right manger. here? A manger, Ryan. Thank you for shouting that out. That's awesome. <laughs> that's right. And if we could, please raise your hand and tell me, in the ancient world, do you guys know what a manger was actually used for back in the day? What was it used for? Feeding trough for animals. That's right. And so this little baby, what was his name that's going to be placed in the manger? I always forget his name. What was it? Jesus. That's right. Jesus is going to be placed in this manger, and he's going to be the greatest gift the world has ever seen. And so sometimes on Christmas, maybe some of you have experienced your parents, your grandparents, and aunts and uncles giving you presents to help us remember that Jesus was the greatest present ever. Sometimes you get boxes, or sometimes you get like stuffed animals wrapped up in wrapping paper, and sometimes you get one of these. So come a little bit closer, not too close, come a little bit closer. And take a look what's inside the manger, these sort of rectangular envelopes. Sometimes you're given these as a present. Yeah, Anna, what are those called? They, they, they normally have nice little sayings that you get at Hallmark. Anybody know what those are? Called? Yes. Cards, yes, Christmas cards. Okay, good. All right, so everybody back up now that you've seen that they're Christmas cards. I need three volunteers, but you have to be a very, very good reader. Very, very good reader. Okay, have a seat, guys. I'm going to get the microphone here. All right, I'm, I'm trying to remember who had their hands up first. Okay. All right, so I think your hand was up. Ebenezer Jr.'s hand was up. All right, so let's start with Roman number one. Oh, I can't wait to see what's inside. You know, sometimes when I get a, a Christmas card, there's money in it. Sometimes there's like a gift card to Toys R Us, my favorite store. Oh! That's a strange Christmas card. Can we see that first line, please? Can you read what it says? I already. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. Very good. So that word is actually Trinity. And as you look up at that, you see a couple shapes. What kind of shapes do you guys see in there? Raise your hand. What kind of shapes do you see? A, a triangle. And that represents the Trinity. Father, God, Son, Holy Spirit. And then there's something else in the middle. A cross. A cross, Ryan. That's right. A cross. And so that's actually the logo of our denomination. And so that's really neat. So Trinity, okay, that's important today. So who's got number two? All right, Ebenezer Jr., can you read that for me? The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. Very good. And so what's that a picture of? A crown. Kids, raise your hand and tell me. Don't shout it out. Raise your hand and tell me who wears a crown? What kind of person, Ben? A king or a queen. That's right. Very good. So clearly, Trinity, crown, we got, we got one more over there. So what, what was in your Christmas card? Oh, that's a strange symbol. Have you ever seen that before? No. no? Okay, go ahead. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Very good. So take a look at that symbol. And I, I see some other shapes in there. Anybody see any shapes in there you want to come? Oh, it acts good? Yeah, and what, what other? Yeah. So if you could go to the next slide, please, John. That's actually an ancient symbol that is pronounced hero. And is a Christian symbol consisting of the two first Greek letters of the title of Christ. And there it is, an X and an R, okay? Christos. Now, what you read is very important for us, that what we're going to talk about today is that when Mary, the mother of Jesus, is told that she's going to have a baby, those are the three parts of his identity that the angel is going to proclaim. The gift of Christmas comes. And that baby is going to be this amazing person that's going to grow up to be the Savior of the whole world. So good job listening, kids. Let me get the candy so there's not a mad rush over here. Hey, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Wait, wait, wait. No pushing, no shoving. I don't want anybody falling in the manger. Here you go. So please grab one piece of candy before you return to your seats. If you attend preschool through first grade, you can head to rest stop with your parents, your grandparents, permission. Thank you. Everyone else, while the kids are getting situated, if you could please open up your Bibles to the book of Luke. That's where we're going to be this morning. If you're a guest with us today, thank you so much for being here. We're excited to have you here. 
We're right in the middle of our Advent season. And what we're working through is the Gospel of Luke. Luke is a tremendous book. It's my favorite gospel because Luke was the most effective, proficient, articulate historian in the ancient world. And so what we saw is that even though Luke was not an eyewitness for most of these events, he didn't just take people's word for granted that had maybe heard about it. He actually went and visited and interviewed the people involved in these stories. Like he actually went to visit Mary, who we're going to meet today, the mother of Jesus. And he asked her to retell the amazing story of what happened to her so that as we saw a few weeks ago, he could then put all of the information together and make an orderly account of this gospel story of Jesus. And so last week, we talked about this person, Zechariah, and his wife, Elizabeth, and how even though they were old and they didn't have any kids, this angel appeared and said, no, 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 you're going to have a son. And he's going to have this huge, important job where he's going to prepare the way for the Messiah by turning everybody's attention away from distractions and turning towards the Lord in order to get ready for the coming Messiah. And in today's passage, we get to meet the mother of Jesus, who we all know is Mary. But we have to see that when we look at these three short passages, that Luke was very intentional about including the important ideas. And we see in this particular passage, the first one, an important doctrine of the Christian faith. We know it as the virgin birth. Now, why is that important? We see that Jesus' birth was the result of a miraculous conception by the power of the Holy Spirit, which accounts for his deity. Jesus was God. Therefore, being the Son of God, his true Father was actually in heaven. Yet being born of a woman meant he was also human, becoming just like one of us, except for being born without the destructive effects of of our sinful nature. So keep all of this in mind as we look at this passage together now, starting with verse 26. Now in the sixth month, that represents the six months of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent an angel Gabriel now to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin name was Mary. The angel went to hear and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How could this be? Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin. Well, the angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so that the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be barren is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. The angel left her. And at that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Spirit, in a loud voice exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child that you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. For blessed is she who has believed what the Lord has sent to her will be accomplished. And then Mary saying, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is His name. His mercy extends to those who fear Him from generation to generation. For He has performed mighty deeds with His arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their innermost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. 
He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham, his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. And so if you were a non-Jewish person living in the first century, we call those folks Gentiles, you don't have the whole history of the Old Testament as part of your understanding of who God is. When you were reading this account, which again Luke wrote primarily to Gentile believers, you would be sort of shocked by today's passage. Because you would assume that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Messiah of all people, would come from a very important city, right? Maybe if the Lord was to come in today's culture, the Messiah should be born in Washington, D.C. But that's not what God's plan was in the first century of all the different places to find a young girl. We see the Lord choose a young girl from Nazareth, the town of Galilee. I mean, this was flyover country if there ever was. This was Nowheresville. So much so, when people learned that Jesus was an adult and he was going around doing miracles, they're like, who's that? They're like, Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth? Are you kidding me? Nazareth? No way. And so yet, from this nowhere's built town, an angel appears to a young girl named Mary. And we see Luke put some important points into the story, saying that she was a virgin pledged to be married. Now, Teenagers, I, I need to let you know here that in the ancient world, you didn't get to pick your spouse. Nope. It was your parents and your spouse's parents who said, oh, they're a good match, right? Matchmaker, matchmaker, make me a match, right? We're not going to do that. But in the ancient world, you did. And then the young couple would come together and they'd make actually a, a legal agreement that said that now the couple's going to live apart for a whole year and then you could go ahead and be married. And if that engagement, that betrothal was broken for any reason, it was the equivalent of getting a divorce. That's how serious it was. And yet here's this young girl who maybe be as young as 12 years old, is pledged to be married to a man named Joseph. And then Luke points out, oh, he's a descendant of David. And so anyone that knows the Old Testament knows that God promised David and his descendants would always be on the throne. So Luke points out that this, in fact, was a fulfillment of God's promises. Because why? God always, always keeps his promises. And so this angel appears as greeting, you are my highly favored. The Lord is with you. Now, I've never seen an angel before. Maybe you have. I'd be terrified. Mary was also concerned, wondering what kind of greeting. And look at what the angel says. Look, the Lord has found favor with you. You will give birth to a child, and he's going to be a boy, and you're going to give him the name Jesus. Now, when we name our children, like so we think of like Clifford and Miranda. They knew it was a boy, and so, of course, they named their son Clifford Jr. Now, that's what we're going to call him, right? Can't wait to meet the guy. I hear he's a great guy. But here's the thing. In the ancient world, when you were given a name, it wasn't just what people called you. It wrapped up an identity of who you were supposed to be. Now, the name Jesus is important because the, the Greek word there, Iesus, is basically taken from the Hebrew Yeshua, which means God is salvation. And so when you say the name of Jesus, maybe you're at work and someone uses the name of Jesus inappropriately, recognize that they're actually declaring God is salvation salvation. And so we see that this boy is going to have, and we're not going to revisit it again because we saw the kids explain those three things on the, on the Christmas cards. He's going to be a very important person because he's going to be the son of the Most High. He's going to be given the throne of his father's David. And there again, what I think is the most important verse for us today, he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. And then Mary has a question. Unlike Zechariah, who started arguing with the angel, Mary had a legitimate question. Now, I'm not going to get into it, but there's something called the birds and the bees. And in the ancient world, people didn't have a full understanding about the birds and the bees, but at least they knew kind of where babies come from. And so Mary asked the angel a legitimate question. Um, how could this be since, since I've never been with a man? And the angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, Mary, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And when you hear that phrase, you should think back to our pie and praise service. Where we remember, we looked at Genesis 1, where it said, The Spirit of God hovered over the formless deep. 
waiting to enact creation. And here once again, the Holy Spirit is active in another type of creation that we know as the Incarnation. And so again, for nothing is impossible. And so just like Zechariah got a sign and he couldn't speak for, for nine months, Mary was given a sign saying, even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child. She's already six months pregnant, and there it is, for nothing is impossible for God. So if you were a 12 or 13 year old girl, knowing full well that what you're about to encounter is going to cause shame, is going to cause embarrassment to your family, you've just been told that you are going to bring forth the Messiah, how would you respond? With the maturity of a saint, she says, I am the Lord's servant. She doesn't argue. She just says, you got the wrong person. Um, there's actually a, a young girl next door. She's much better equipped for this. No, no, no. May it be to me as you have said. Now keep in mind, Mary did nothing to deserve this. She was not perfect. She made mistakes. And yet of all the people in the whole ancient world, God chose her by grace alone to bring forth a Messiah. So here she is, she she's, knows she's going to get pregnant. We know from other passages that the angel also went to Joseph and said, look, your, your fiancé, she's pregnant, but it's not because of adultery. Because in the ancient world, a woman that's found guilty of adultery would be stoned to death. So no, 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 you're going to marry her. God's working here. And so she then decides to go see Elizabeth. And this was a three-day journey. Could you imagine walking somewhere for three days? Even a little bit pregnant. Morning sickness? Yuck. But for three days she's walking. I have to wonder if while she's walking to go see her cousin, those three days, is she wondering, you know, are, 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 is my family going to disown me because I'm pregnant? Uh, are my friends going to stop talking to me? Am I going to be just the, the, the black sheep of the entire community? But yet when she walks into Elizabeth's home, and I, can't, I don't know how exactly it went, but she must have walked in and said, What's up, cuz? How you doing? Immediately, six months in utero, John the Baptist does a somersault inside of her mother's womb. Now again, I've never been pregnant. <laughs> never. But I've been around some women that have been pregnant. And it's something else to put your hand, and this is for men, put your hand on the tummy and feel that little flutter, flutter, flutter. Right? For women, it's like, get away from me. <laughs> He's kicking my bladder. I, I don't know how that experience, but can you imagine just the sound of Mary's voice caused John the Baptist to do a couple somersaults inside her, his mother's room. And Mary, filled with the Spirit, shouts a blessing, blessed are you among women for the child you are bearing. I think what's so important is verse 45. Elizabeth understands that blessed is she, blessed is Mary, who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. And then that final section, we don't have a lot of time to look at it, but it was a song. And I have to wonder, when Luke interviewed Mary, did he go up to her and say, hey Mary, can you sing that song again? I'm sure it was great. Can you sing it for me? Now we don't know the melody, but what we see in it, it gives us a beautiful illustration of this upside down kingdom of God, where a humble person like Mary could be lifted into such a magnificent position where all generations will remember her. And then we see in verse 50, she sings that his mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. And then several times, he has brought down rulers, but yet lifted up the humble. He has lifted up those who are hungry and sent the rich away empty. And you see Mary understands, even at age 12 or 13, a maturity that says that things are not as they seem in God's kingdom. Because for a person living in the ancient world that hears that the Messiah is going to come, those in the Roman Empire probably thought that the Lord would choose a daughter of Caesar. And then she'd be in Rome and there'd be this great fanfare. Or if there was a person from the Jewish community, they thought that the Lord would choose a daughter of the high priest in Jerusalem. That's not what God decided. Of all the people to choose a lowly, poor girl to be elevated to such a high position of honor. Not because she did anything to deserve it, mind you. Not that because she was better than anybody else. But yet, God's grace came to her and said, you are going to be the person that the whole world is going to remember. 
And then on December 13, 2015, people are going to talk about you. And so when we think about this, and when we understand the significance of it all, we see that in our world, we have to decide a few things. So, so think back to the children's room. Can we see that, please? So real briefly, it'll show up, right? The key row. When you look at that, I want you to remember this phrase that we saw in today's passage. It is His kingdom, Christ, that will never end. Now when you heard that, when you heard it read, did you, did it sort of click in your head and say, wait a minute here, why is that so significant? Well, as we see, once His kingdom is established, and it was, it's established, will never, ever, 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 ever end. The one who always was king will set up a kingdom where the presence of His authority and the benefits of salvation are distributed to those who ally themselves with Him. And that's the key. That I don't know if you realize this, but right now we have a king. We can't see him, but he's up there. He's up in heaven and he's seated at the right hand of God the Father. He was the king. God the Father gave him the throne over the whole universe because of what he did through his life, death, and resurrection. And now he's ruling. Did you know that? It doesn't matter what's going on in the world. It doesn't matter who's present. It doesn't matter who's over here. It doesn't matter. He's still the king. And so here's the question I want you to ask yourself today. Who's your king? Who's your king? Is it a politician? Is it a celebrity? Or is it yourself? Do you like to be in charge? Do you like to dictate what you're going to do in your life? Because you're the king. And so during this Christmas season, when all of the world, and again, it's, it's amazing when you watch the news how divided the world is and how polarized our nation is. And even among Christians, they're at each other's throats. And for them I ask, who's your king? Because if Christ is our king, then we recognize that he has come and he's coming again. And just because we don't see him, doesn't mean he's still not in charge. And when we ally ourselves with him, and we understand his commandments, and we honor what that manger represents, we acknowledge that no matter what else is going on in the world, that he will reign and is reigning forever. So I'll ask you, who's your king? Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, it's so good to get into your word this morning. With all the craziness and the busyness of the Christmas season, we stop and we look at this wonderful story. Not from a great palace, not from a great temple, but you chose a young woman to bring forth the greatest gift of all. Who didn't stay a baby, that became a man and lived a perfect life, and yet died for me and for everyone gathered here and then rose from the grave, and now an ascended king on the throne who will reign forever. Lord, it's hard to, to be reminded of that when we go through our daily life and we don't actually see our king. But Lord, we know he's there, and we know he's reigning, and we know he will reign forever. So help us to live like you are our king. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.